We've talked about the short run and the long run. And there's another concept that I want to talk about, although I'm going to argue that there are some fundamental problems with it, and so we won't use it any further besides this one lesson. I call it the very long run. And it's like the long run, except it has one other feature, namely that you allow firms to enter or exit the market. So if there's positive profit, firms will enter, and <clears throat> that's going to push the supply curve to the right. It's going to put push prices down, and so that positive profit will eventually get competed away. If there's negative profit, then you assume there's exit. As firms leave the industry, the supply curve is going to shift back. That's going to raise the price, and eventually profit isn't negative anymore. Posit profit becomes zero. So the idea behind the very long run is that you have zero profit in the very long run because the process of entry or exit has finished and and therefore everything's calm in the market. There are, there are zero profits. Now remember zero profit is okay because you're covering your opportunity costs. This is zero economic profit. So firms are, firms are perfectly happy making zero economic profit. And, and and so that's the character characteristic which which I'll refer to as the very long run. Textbooks usually call it the long run, but that's confusing because we already defined the long run in a different way to be the situation where the firm can pick any amounts of inputs, like it has free choice over water and fertilizer. So the very long run adds to that idea the idea of of entry and exit and that 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 entry and exit process has finished. So let me illustrate on the left hand side with one firm and on the right hand side with the whole corn market. On the left hand side I have the long run average cost. On the right hand side I have the demand curve called D1 and a supply curve called S1. They intersect at this price and so that's, we'll call it P1. And that, of course, is also equal to the initial average revenue and marginal revenue. So you know what the firm is going to do because you've studied the other part of the course. So this is the marginal cost curve. So you know the firm is going to go where marginal revenue equals marginal cost, which is here. And you can also see that that's going to result in zero profit because at that point average revenue, uh, which is this line, and average cost, long run average cost, it's, it's number one, is this line, that they meet at that red point. And so profit is equal to zero. So, so the red point that I've drawn on the left hand graph represents a very long run equilibrium point where everything's fine in the market because on the right hand side supply equals demand and everything's fine for each individual firm because profits are zero. Now suppose, let's go to the upper right, suppose there's a shock and the shock that I'm going to refer to is an increase in demand. Suppose for example that people find out that uh, this e eating corn cures cancer, and so there's a big increase in demand. So, so demand shifts. Uh, demand is going to shift from D1 to D2, and what happens then is you get an, an increase in price, and the initial increase in price is over, goes over to here. That is going to mean, because you have an increase in price, that profit occurs. Positive profit occurs now, because there's a new increase, increase in price. And that's going to attract firms. And so what you're going to get is you're going to get entry of firms. They're attracted by the positive profit the new positive profit because price has now price has now gone up as firms enter you you get uh, 
more and more supply. I just realized I'm going to have to change a couple of the lines in order for this to work out, so I'll do that really quickly. So I've moved the supply curve on the right-hand diagram and also shifted one of the curves I haven't talked about yet on the left-hand diagram. So as I was saying, you have an increase in demand from D1 to D2, and that makes the new place where demand equals supply in the right-hand diagram this point here, so price jumps up a lot from where it was before. Price jumps up much higher than P1, and that's going to attract entry. So that's the point where we were before. We have entry, and, and because you've got entry, the uh, supply curve is going to start shifting out. So these are different supply curves. S2, S3, S4, and they're shifting out due to entry. That's the, the increase in supply curve. Clearly, that means the equilibrium price is starting to fall as you get entry. But there's an idea in the very long run that this entry can cause things to happen in the water and fertilizer markets. In particular, you have ideas of increasing cost industries, constant cost industry, and decreasing cost industry. So I'm going to illustrate this with an increasing cost industry. And what this means is that as the number of firms goes up, the price of water and fertilizer go up. I should probably write that down. So as the number of firms goes up, the price of water and the price of fertilizer go up. That's what we mean by an increasing cost industry. If you had a decrease in cost industry, then when the number of firms went up, the price of water and fertilizer would fall. And if you had a constant cost industry, then as the number of firms went up, the price of water and fertilizer wouldn't change. Now, what this means is that on the right-hand diagram, as you go from S1 to S2 to S3 to S4, on the left-hand diagram, something is changing. Because the price of water and price of fertilizer are going up. And so the firm's costs are going up. So I've illustrated that by another long run average cost curve for for example maybe this is um maybe this is here long run average cost at position three. So you see that the long run average cost has gone up because of the price of water and price of fertilizer going up. So what happens is this market is not in equilibrium anymore. Things are moving around a lot. Where it will finish up is going to be here. I don't know what to call this, maybe S, I don't know, S9. So you have lots of different shifts with the supply curve. Um, finally, end up, let's say, at S9 and at LRAC9 and at P9. On the right-hand diagram, you're at an equilibrium. More importantly, in the left-hand diagram, you're also at an equilibrium with, P with P9 and LARC9 because that combination gives you price or average revenue, P9, which is here, and average cost, AC9, which is here. And so you see that they they touch, and that's where the you know that's where the firm is going to produce. The firm is going to end up producing here. So everything seems fine at a price of P9. The right-hand diagram is okay, the left-hand diagram is okay, and this is where textbooks end the story. They say, okay, now we've established a new very long-run equilibrium in the right-hand diagram that's at this point, and end of story. The problem is that's not the end of the story. What these discussions forget about is what's happened to the water market and what's happened to the fertilizer market. 
The idea of very long run equilibrium is that everybody's earning zero profit. And yes, when you get to this, the end of the story as I just recounted it, the corn firms are earning zero profit. But you need to make sure that the water and fertilizer firms are earning zero profit as well. And they aren't. Because we've had the price of water and price of fertilizer rise. And so, sure, the corn farms might be back in very long run equilibrium, but the water and fertilizer industries are not in very long run equilibrium because they're, those firms are making positive profit, strictly positive profit, because the price of what they're selling goes up. Now, there's a natural first response to that. Oh, okay, well then, let's do these same diagrams for the water market and the fertilizer market. The price of water has gone up, so profit has appeared in the water market, so new firms are going to enter the water market, and the supply curve is going to shift. And, and in other words, let's just draw the same diagrams for the water market and for the fertilizer market. Can't we get in? Can't we just do that and then show that how they get into very long run equilibrium? But here's the problem. Imagine starting that with, let's say, the fertilizer market. So after you finish with this story and you got to S9 and P9 and LRC9 and everything's fine in the corn market, you say, okay, but the fertilizer market's out of equilibrium, out of very long run equilibrium. So we're going to work on the fertilizer market now. So you get out another, sh another sheet of paper and you draw the graphs of the fertilizer market and you say, okay, there's a positive profit in the fertilizer market, so we're going to get entry. New firms are going to go into the fertilizer market. And, uh, well, and then what? Then uh, something's going to happen to the price of fertilizer, and something's going to happen to the long run average cost curve in the fertilizer market. I mean, it might be a constant cost industry, but if it's not, then fertilizer is an increase in cost industry or a decrease in cost industry. So, in other words, you've got changes happening in the fertilizer market. Well, when you have changes that happen in the fertilizer market that's going to affect the price of water, that means here in the corn market, you're not in very long run equilibrium anymore. Because long run average cost, which you thought was just going to stay at LRAC 9, now it's not going to stay, at, it's going to move because you're messing up the f fertilizer market. So you might have gotten the corn market into a very long run equilibrium, but it but the economy isn't in a very long run equilibrium. And if you want to get the fertilizer market to go to very long run equilibrium, then the corn market gets out of very long run equilibrium. And you also have adjustments going on in the water market. So where does it end up? Well, there's no way to tell where it ends up, at least not with graphs. It's completely impossible to graph the corn market, graph the water market, graph the fertilizer market, and try to figure out when, if you have a disturbance in the current market where everything is going to all end up. It just it can't be done. Um, if you have equations, uh, you may be able to find a new, a new position using mathematics, but it's uh, certainly not, not possible to do it using graphs. And, and so for that reason, I don't teach the very long run anymore. I mean, I don't put it on exams uh, because it's got this theoretical flaw. It, the The explanation is fine as long as you just stop with the with the new very long run equilibrium in the corn market. But you can't just stop there because you've already the whole idea of why the long run average cost in the corn market has been shifting is because of things going on in the water and fertilizer markets. So it's not legitimate to just mention the water and fertilizer markets for part of the story and forget about what happens to them for the rest of the story. Therefore, I won't have anything more to say about the notion of the very long run, except to say that uh, it's usually simply called the long run. And you will see in your textbook and other textbooks, people talking about the long run, characterizing the long run as a situation where you have zero profit. And so I wanted to be sure you guys understand that for your future economics courses, why people say will say that the long run is characterized by zero profit.